Hello, everyone, and welcome to 2021 North American Week of Prayer. Our topic this week is having confidence in the Lord. And I am tasked with thinking with you about things that we put our confidence in that we should not. And after prayerfully considering the matter, I've decided to pick up the life of Abraham in addressing what I've been tasked to do. Both Isaiah and James call Abraham a friend of God. His name is in 26 books of the Bible. He's a familiar character to us. Not a perfect man, but as we'll see today, uh, the Lord was very patient with Abraham and bringing him along, teaching him lessons. And it's the same with us as well. So in Genesis chapter 11, we're picking up now the life of Abraham. Uh, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen says that the God of glory appeared to Abraham, Abram at that time, and promised him a land and a great name, a people, uh, this inheritance, he would have to leave Ur and obtain it, go to a land that he knew not where was at, the book of Hebrews tells us. In each of these chapters, we find that God was teaching Abraham something. And in chapter 11, we read that it wasn't Abraham leading the expedition to Cana, the promised land. It was his father, Terah. Terah means delay. And Terah took them to Haran, which was a little over halfway to the promised land, and then they stopped. As a matter of fact, they were in Haran for about five years. Haran means uh, parched. Terah means delay. And it wasn't until after Terah's death that God again admonished Abraham uh, to get to the land that he had promised. And so what Abraham learned in chapter 11 is not to have confidence in people. God told him to leave. He wasn't supposed to bring his family. In delayed obedience and partial obedience is still disobedience and has uh, consequences, a parched spiritual life. The psalmist puts it this way, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And then in chapter 12, we find that Abraham arrives in the promised land and and the God of glory again meets with Abraham at Bethel, which means the house of God. Abraham builds an altar there and he worships the Lord. But shortly after that, Abraham starts moving away from Bethel, the house of God. He moves towards Ai, which is a pile of rubble. And then when the famine came into the land, it was so severe that the Abraham did not consult the Lord. He just thought, my only solution to this trial is to go to Egypt. Egypt symbolizes the world. And whenever believers divert into the world to try to resolve their problems, things just get worse. And that's what, exactly what happened to Abraham. So he goes to um, Egypt, and it's going to be a very expensive trip for Abraham. Um, Egypt, again, symbolizes the world, the intellectual world. And uh, sadly, Abraham built no altars in Egypt. It wasn't until he came back up out of the world that, again, he started having uh, this communion with God. He was back into the presence of the Lord. And um, when he left Egypt, there were a lot of entrapments. So that's something that that Abraham learned in chapter 12, was not to have confidence in the world. Very expensive trip for Abraham, and it did not resolve any of his problems. Also in chapter 12, we learned something else that Abraham was to have no confidence in, and that is his speech, and specifically a deceptive or lying tongue. Sometimes we think that when we're in a trial, uh, we can somehow escape it if we can talk our way out of it or spin the truth. Uh, Paul tells us to put away all lying, speak the truth in love. That's something that a believer shouldn't do. And in chapter 12, Abraham tells his wife, Sarah, to lie to, he says, you're such a beautiful lady that if the locals know that you're my husband, they'll probably kill me and take you anyway. So just tell them that you're my sister to start with which was a half true. They, they had the same father, but not the same mother. And Abraham definitely wanted everyone else to, to grip the wrong side of that truth, the bad side of it, the deceptive side. 
Well, God intervenes. Sarah is taken, um, but before anything can happen to her, um, God plagues Pharaoh and his household. Pharaoh knows something's up, and so he returns Sarah to Abraham and uh, reproves the man of faith for uh, being deceptive. Could have taken her into his harem. She could have became his wife. And again, um, Abraham was not to have confidence in his speech, especially in a, in a deceptive way. The consequences to his marriage, the deepest need of a, a woman is security and significance. And that, that doesn't prove much love to your wife when you tell her that you want her to die instead of you, which is basically what he was saying. Proverbs 12, 19 puts it this way, the truthful lip shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Eventually the truth comes out. In chapter 13, Abraham comes out of Egypt. Um, there are the entrapments. That trip affected his marriage. Uh, Lot got a taste of the world in his mouth he could never shake. There was a young handmaiden named Hagar, who will become a little too available later. Um, they also come out with a lot of riches. And um, actually in chapter 13 is the first mention of riches. So much so that, that Abraham and Lot cannot dwell together anymore. Their herdsmen are having conflict. It uh, grieved Abraham's heart that the Perizzites and the Canaanites, their neighbors, would see this contention among the brethren. And so Abraham comes to Lot. Abraham had the title deed to the whole land. So he comes to Lot and says, you choose one direction and I'll go the other direction. And Lot looked up, lifted his eyes and he saw Sodom and the Jordanian plain. And uh, he said, man, that reminds me of Egypt. And that's where he went. He's a, uh, a carnal man. He was, because he trusted in the promise that God gave Abraham, uh, Peter calls him righteous Lot. He was imputed righteousness, but he lived as a carnal man, and eventually he loses everything. So Abraham uh, shows us in this chapter not to have confidence in riches, but take the, uh, the low place in order that there might be peace among the brethren, compromise, uh, give up our rights in order that there might be peace, not have confidence in riches. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 17, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in certain unriches, but in the living God. And we see shortly after that, that God comes to Abraham after he's taken this position, not trusting in riches, uh, being willing to part with what's his, God affirms uh, the land that he will give him. And then in chapter 14, we see uh, four Mesopotamian kings coming from the east and they uh, attack and overtake the Jordanian kings. And they take Sodom, they take Gomorrah, of course, Slot is in Sodom, so they capture him, uh, Abraham's nephew, and all of his goods, and they start heading north. Now, when Abraham hears about it, he takes his servants, 318 of them, armed, and they head north. And it takes them about 250 miles to track down and uh, overcome these Mesopotamian kings, but they do so and they recover everything. It takes a while, but they start heading south back to the uh, Jordanian Valley. And there are two kings that are coming out to meet Abraham. The first king that's talked about is Melchizedek. His name means king of righteousness, and he was also the king of Salem or Jerusalem. Salem means peace, and he's a beautiful type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 5 and Hebrews 7 pick this up because there was no record of his days, genealogies, his death. Uh, he pictures the eternal priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never heard of him before. He steps out of scripture. Um, he comes to meet Abraham. He sets bread and wine before him, and then he reminds Abraham that Elion, God Most High, is the one who delivered you from your enemies. The one who possesses heaven and earth, he's the one who delivered you. 
And so he sets this meal before him of bread and wine, a remembrance feast that it had been God who gave him the victory and uh, to keep the right disposition before the Lord. <clears throat> and then we see Abraham giving Melchizedek a tithe in appreciation for what he's done. Then the other king arrives, King Sodom. He pictures the devil. He doesn't care about the goods. He just wants the people. He tells Abraham, well, you can keep all the spoil. And then we see Abraham saying, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you say I have made Abraham rich. And so he just repeats, Abraham just repeats what Melchizedek told him. There was this remembrance feast to get Abraham focused on the one who had delivered him. And it gives Abraham a humble disposition and he's not going to take any of it. Um, he doesn't want Satan or the king of Sodom to have any glory in what Abraham has accomplished or what he has. Uh, all that goes to the Lord. So in chapter 14, um, Abraham learns not to have confidence in his strength. It's God who gives the victory. And the bread and wine and the president of Melchizedek reminded Abraham who gave him that victory. And it's the same for us on the Lord's day when we remember the Lord. Furthermore, Moses would tell the Israelites later in the book of Deuteronomy that their future kings were not to multiply horses, war horses, Deuteronomy 17, 16. They weren't to have a confidence in their weapons or their armor. You know, the Lord Jesus reminded his disciples of that in chapter Luke chapter 11, verse 23. And not to have confidence in large armies. That was David's sin when he numbered the nation of Israel, the tribes. He wanted to know how big his army was. His confidence wasn't in the Lord. He wanted to boast in his, the number of his soldiers. And that brought consequences to the nation. In chapter 15, we have this lovely verse where the Lord comes to Abraham and he says, Do not be afraid. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. That had to be such an encouragement to Abraham to know that God was his protector and that he himself was his reward. No greater reward than having communion, enjoying the presence of of Elion, the Most High God. Cool. A verse to just show the encouragement that God wants to give his people by his presence. Second Chronicles 20 verse 7 says, Abraham would be God's friend forever. He wasn't a perfect man and God is teaching Abraham things as he goes along, not to have confidence in things. And um, we can learn from these as well. And then in chapter 16, we have a sad chapter. Um, Abraham and Sarah, they've been 10 years in the land. They haven't had any children. Um, Abraham, or Sarah comes up with this scheme to give her husband, her handmaiden as a concubine, Hagar as a concubine, and to raise up children to her through Hagar. And Abraham doesn't consult the Lord. He listens to his wife. And he takes Hagar as a concubine, and she conceives. And we see that in verse 4, chapter 16, that Hagar, after she conceived, despised Sarah. And it's always that way. Um, Hagar came from Egypt. She's a worldling. And when men and women of faith live hypocritical lives, and they don't trust in the word of the Lord, but their own wisdom, the world is right there to mock us. And that's exactly what happened to Sarah. Lord intervenes because <clears throat> Hagar runs away and he tells her to go back and put herself under authority. She's going to have a son named Ishmael. And Ishmael is a representation of the flesh all the way through scripture. Paul expands that quite a bit in Galatians chapter 4. And so we saw in chapter 16 that Abraham had confidence in his own wisdom and his flesh. Ishmael is born. You have 13 years of silence then. 
13 is a number to symbolize rebellion in scripture. It's first introduced to us that way in chapter 14, where the Mesopotamian kings put the kings of Jordan under servitude for 12 years and the 13th year they rebelled. And so I think it's no accident that the Lord comes to Abraham after 13 years of silence and then reminds Abraham of his covenant 13 times in chapter 17. This is a restoration chapter. And so we see God in verse 1 saying, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. Abraham was going to have a new walk, blameless walk. God is a holy God. And if we want to walk with him, we have to walk in holiness. Something that John tells us in his first epistle in chapter 1. If we want to have the Lord's presence, a communion, we have to walk in the light. He will not walk in the darkness with us. And so he's going to have a new walk. And he also gets a new name. So far he's been Abram, exalted father. But now he's going to be Abraham the father of multitudes. But in the Hebrew, the suffix is actually not pronounced. It's just a rush of air, Abraham. And Sarai is going to go to Sarah. And whenever God breathes on something, it gets life. John 20 is a great example of that. And also the creation of Adam. God um, scoops up some dirt and breathes a living spirit into Adam. And he stands up a living soul. And it's just a, the spirit of God moving and animating and giving life. And so what we're seeing here is the restoration of Abraham, the animation of the, the spirit of God within his life. And he also gets a, a new sign of the covenant, male circumcision. Keep in mind, Abraham is 99 years of age. And the Lord says, I'm going to give you a sign circumcision. Something will be a daily reminder. It's a stripping away from the male member. <clears throat> the member that would identify Abraham as a man, that's what God was focusing on. He's stripping away the old identity. There's a new identity. And it was to remind Abraham to have no confidence in his flesh. And that's exactly what Paul tells us that circumcision, spiritual circumcision is in the New Testament. So he gets a new walk. He gets a new name, a new identity, a new beginning. Uh, he's have to have no confidence in his flesh in chapter 17. And that brings us then into chapter 18, which is a wonderful chapter. Every verse in this chapter, it just permeates with... Um, the man of faith in fellowship and communion with his God. So we see Abraham in the first part of the chapter rushing back and forth to refresh the heart of God. He's offering up worship before the Lord. He's humble. He bows low, shaka, before the Lord. That word's normally translated worship in the Old Testament. And so he's offering up what he knows will please the Lord. And then he stands and he receives from the Lord in silence, he receives from the Lord the promises of God. And he, and he learns about the character of God and the attributes of God. God says, is there anything too hard for me? The answer is no. And then we see Abraham walking along with the Lord as they venture towards Sodom. Abraham doesn't say a word. He's just being quieted by the love of God encouraged in the Lord's presence. God has high accolades that he gives his man of faith. And Abraham's just soaking it up, walking along in perfect communion with his God. And at the end of the chapter, we see Abraham stopping and then taking a step near the Lord to make intercession for the wayward. God knew the heart of his man of faith, and he was seeking an intercessor. And he knew he would find it in Abraham. And Abraham stepped in the gap for the wayward. And it pleased the Lord for him to do so. And so these four things, offering worship up to the Lord, receiving um, revelation from the Lord, walking along with the Lord in communion, and then uh, making intercession before the Lord are the same four things that the early church enjoyed in Acts chapter 2. They 
received the apostles' doctrine, revelation from the Lord. They enjoyed the fellowship. As they were in fellowship with the Lord, they enjoyed fellowship with each other. It's his fellowship. And they enjoyed the Lord's Supper, offering to the Lord what they knew would please him. And they also lifted up prayers. They made intercession for the wayward, asking God for grace to carry on and um, represent him in the world as they should. And these are the same things that we can enjoy. When you see this chapter and the beautiful fellowship that, that Abraham has with his God, when we look back to see what he had learned, having no confidence in man, having no confidence in the world, having no confidence in speech, having no confidence in strength, no confidence in riches, no confidence in his wisdom. His confidence was in the Lord, the one who was his shield and his reward. And as a result of that, he gets this beautiful communion and fellowship with the Lord in chapter 18. So when we look at what this man of faith has, we as men and women of faith, why would we ever want to put our confidence in anything else but the Lord?